Hello everyone and welcome to lesson number five in the Faith to Love video series. Today our lesson is entitled Knowledge. We are in 2 Peter chapter 1 and we are looking specifically at verses 5 through 7 as Peter describes the building of the Christian character. And Peter says you're doing this because of the grace that God has extended to you in giving you all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of, of God and that it is through his glory and virtue that we have been called and he has given us these exceedingly great and precious promises that we might be sharers in his divine nature. And Peter says because of that, because of that, earnestly, with all diligence, get on it when it comes to being the person that is sharing in the divine nature with God. And so he says, this is, this is what a Christian character should look like. This is what a follower of Christ should look like. And so he begins to describe these different attributes, and he begins with faith. And then he says, now you're going to add to your faith supply it with virtue. And then to your virtue, you're going to supply knowledge. And so that's where we are today. We're going to look at this word knowledge and talk about what it means and how we can develop it. So the Greek word that is used here for knowledge is gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. The G may have been pronounced um, in the actual Greek language. I'm not sure. I'm not a Greek scholar, but um, I have heard it pronounced gnosis. Um, but in our English language, of course, we typically leave off that G sound. Um, so sometimes it is pronounced gnosis. But the meaning of that word here is a functional working knowledge. A functional working knowledge. It is something that is obtained from personal experience from study, from observation. It is the receiving of instruction. It is a um, creating a, an understanding. And so this is um, also sometimes the idea of connecting a theory, a belief, with uh, the way it would be applied. So from theory to application. So sometimes in scripture, it is actually translated to the word understanding. So sometimes this word gnosis will be translated to the word understanding in our English language. Um, just a little side note and some interesting facts about um, etymology, if you are interested. Our word prognosis, so for all you healthcare people out there, prognosis, that's the, the word gnosis you see there, G-N-O-S-I-S, meaning to know, and then the prefix pro, P-R-O, meaning before. So when we talk about giving somebody a prognosis, the literal meaning of that is to know before. So it's this idea of foreknowledge or being able to predict the course of a disease, to know beforehand what is going to happen, to give a prognosis. So that's just kind of a little interesting a tidbit for you. Also the word diagnosis, diagnosis, there's that word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, meaning to know, and then the prefix dia, D-I-A, meaning between. So listen to this, how neat this is. To know between. When you diagnose somebody, you are making a um, discernment, a distinguishing between something and something else. Maybe there were some um, different possibilities of, of uh, diseases that it could be, but then being able to pinpoint one based on the symptoms, you are going to be able to know between different diseases which one it is you're going to diagnose. So another little interesting tidbit for you. But anyway, so the word gnosis, is, is the actual word that is used here. And it's used many times in scripture. It's used in many different places. So I thought we might look at some places where this word is used 
and just see what this word knowledge is referring to. So the first one, and this is on the worksheet, don't forget to click the link below for the worksheet if you wanna follow along there. The first scripture reference I have on your sheet is Luke chapter one, verse 77. So let's see how the word is used here in Luke one, verse 77. It says, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Now this is a, a prophecy from Zacharias who is giving this, um, this prophecy, going through this, this um, text here. He is talking about Jesus and he is making a prophecy about Jesus and it says, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. So this is talking about knowing, not having the understanding of salvation or coming to know salvation, to, to receive instruction on it, to, to have a working knowledge, a functional knowledge on what salvation is. And so that's the first exam uh, example of gnosis here in scripture. And then let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. And here it says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is coming to know or to understand the glory of God. And in this particular verse, it's talking about the gospel. It's talking about the light of the gospel. And so um, there's a connection there between the light of the gospel and the light that is talking about shining in our hearts um, there in verse 6. But it is coming to know the glory of God. Another example in scripture, Philippians chapter 3 verse 8 Philippians 3 verse 8 it says yes yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ so here is talking about having a knowledge um, of Christ Jesus so coming to know or have a working knowledge and understanding of who Christ is, an understanding of Christ. The last um, scripture reference I have is in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 20, this is Paul writing the letter to Timothy and this is a, a warning that he is giving Timothy at the very end of this letter where he says, O oh, Timothy, Guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. So here is this idea that knowledge can be false. It can be a false kind of knowledge. So I just wanted to give an idea of how gnosis is used elsewhere in scripture. But we find that there's other things, there's specific things that we can receive instruction on, that we can that we can gain understanding on. And so another distinction that I want to make between this word gnosis is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And on your worksheet on number three, I have listed a number of scriptures, Romans chapter 11, verse 33, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8, and Colossians 2, verse 3. We won't read all three of those, but let me just turn to one, and I'll just turn to that first one in Romans. Romans chapter 11, verse 33, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So the two words there for wisdom and knowledge are two different words. The word gnosis is the word that's used there for knowledge, but it's a different word that's used there for wisdom. So they're different. They're two different things. And so 
um, knowledge is this, this um, understanding, this working knowledge, a functional working knowledge. It is, it is instruction. It is knowing something. And so it's different from wisdom, which is taking that knowledge and applying it and putting it into action. And so that is um, the difference that we see between knowledge and wisdom. And that's the difference in all three of these verses. You can flip to them and look at them a little bit closer later if you'd like to. Um, but I do want to point that out that it's a little bit different. Number four on your worksheet says, how does knowledge relate to the attributes that come before it? Faith and virtue. So let's go back to our text real quick in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Remember, we are intensifying as we are supplying each one of these attributes. So we started with faith. And remember, faith is our belief. It is our belief, but it is also paired up with our hope. And then because we have this belief and this hope, we obey. It, it motivates us to, to obey and, and that puts us into action. And so then we add to our belief, our faith, virtue. And we talked about virtue and how virtue is this moral excellence or the courage to do the right thing. And so now you've got this belief and you have this, this drive to do what's right and you have the courage to do what you know you need to do. Now we add knowledge because now you have to know what it is that you need to do. You can have the belief in your heart and you can have the, the drive and the willingness and the desire to do what you should, but then you keep growing in knowledge. You keep adding to that knowledge and you continue to grow in that way. And so this is this kind of continual growth. Remember, these attributes are supplying and it's not really just a, okay, faith, check, got that done, virtue, check, got that done, knowledge, check. These are ongoing and continuous things and we're just augmenting them with each new characteristic. And so we are adding knowledge. We'll never get to the point where we know it all, where we know everything that we need to know about what the Bible has to say, what God wants us to know, and what God wants us to learn. We're not ever going to get to that point where we can just say, got it, I'm good. And so it's important that we continue to grow in these areas. But I love the way it comes after virtue. It's, it's the belief got the belief, it, it's, it's making me want to, to obey and to follow acts of obedience. And then I've got this willingness to do what I need to do. I've got the courage to do it. Now I'm going to grow in knowledge and understanding. And these are, these are understanding just spiritual truths, just basic spiritual truths. This knowledge here in this text is not it's not full knowledge. It's not, it's not this overall um, um, wisdom type of, of situation. We are, this is learning the basic spiritual truths. And so it's different. And if you, this is interesting, we might, I think, come back to this a little bit later. But the knowledge that is used, the word knowledge that's used back in verse 2 and verse 3 is epinosis, epinosis, which is E-P-I-G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. And so this word is an over knowledge, epi meaning beyond or over or upon. It's a deeper knowledge, a deeper understanding. And so this knowledge here is different from that knowledge there. This is a continue growing in your understanding of God's will. That's what this knowledge is here. And so what is the danger that comes from lack of knowledge? What if you just ignore it? What if you just decide, oh, I don't, I, I'm good with my faith. I'm good with my 
my virtue, and then, you know, you just kind of stop. What's the danger of that? Well, I think it might be a good thing for us to kind of pause there and look at the life of Paul and the example that we, we can get from him in Scripture. So we'll come back and fully answer number five in a second, but let's kind of jump forward to question number six what, that says, what can we learn from the life of Paul about being eager to serve but not having knowledge? And so if you've got your Bible, we can flip back in, um, in your Bible to Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 20, let's see, chapter 22, Acts 22. This is when Paul is giving a defense for himself. He's explaining his story to the, the Jerusalem mob, the people that have, have um, taken him and want to, um, to persecute him. And he is trying to make a defense for who he is and what he's doing. And so he's explaining to them about his past, who he is, and he gets to, let's see, in chapter 22, verse 3, he says, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. This is Paul saying, I was zealous for God. That means I was enthusiastic. I was passionate. I was eager to do the right thing. I was eager to serve God. But he did it in the wrong way because of lack of knowledge. Because of lack of knowledge. And he explains later and I believe it's in 1 Timothy where he says, yes, it's 1 Timothy chapter 1 in verse 12 and 13. Again, Paul writing Timothy and he says, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So here are a couple places where Paul says, I was zealous towards God. I was zealous wanting to serve him. But then later he says, but I was doing it in ignorance. He did not have the knowledge about who Jesus was and what Jesus came and what he did. And so then everything changed, of course, on the road to Damascus when Jesus talked to him. But what we learn is that the danger from lack of knowledge can lead us down the wrong path. We can go in a direction that is not the direction that we need to, to go. And it may be that we are, are not doing it out of, we're not going the wrong way out of, out of lack of sincerity or lack of enthusiasm. But it may be that we are going to go the wrong way or not do something that we should be doing because we don't have the knowledge. That's the danger. We have to constantly be learning and constantly growing when it comes to spiritual understanding. And so um, that in fact is, is the way that Peter ends his letter at the very, very end of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Peter leaves his readers with this um, encouragement that you grow in grace and in knowledge. Keep growing. And so that is so important. The Bible talks about us growing in our knowledge. And I put a couple of references on your worksheet. Hebrews chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Both of these scripture references here are talking about the milk and the meat of the word. And I'm not going to um, just jump into those too deeply right now. I do want you to read them. Read Hebrews 5 um, verses 12 through 13 or 14, I'm sorry, and 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, because these are talking about 
growing in knowledge, when we start with, with the basics um, and learning basic spiritual truths, that's the milk. But then as we grow, we continue to study and we get deeper. We start to need something more substantial and we move into the meat of the word. And that is this progression in, in obtaining knowledge and in learning and in studying. And so the Bible talks about it and talks about it as being important. I want to um, wrap up with just a couple of thoughts here. And I want one of those is going to be a story and I'm going to save that for the end. But how do we grow in knowledge? Well, we have to study. We have to get into the word and we have to study. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 15 is the verse that says, study to show yourself approved. We have to, we have to get into scripture and we have to read it. We have to take advantage of opportunities to learn. Um, that is, that is just, it's just absolutely necessary for all of us to spend time in God's word, reading it and learning it and applying it. And so that's, that's number one. And we can know that everything that we need is in scripture. And second Timothy chapter three, verses 16 and 17 tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scriptures, the Bible, God's word tells us everything that we need for every good work so that we can go out and be thoroughly equipped. And so we know that everything that we need is here, but we need to get into it and we need to study it and we need to spend time in it. The last couple things that I have on your sheet is um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, which talks about how we are being transformed. We are being transformed into the image of Christ. And in order to do that, we have to spend time in the only thing we have in this world that is not of this world, the, the Bible. We have to spend our time in scripture and we have to spend our time meditating on the word of God so that we can learn more and more about what we need to do to become more like his son. We have to set our mind on things that are not in this world, set our minds on things that are above and, and focus on where we're going and what we need to know in order to get there. And so Colossians chapter three, verses one through four is that little set of scriptures that talk about setting your mind not on things in this world, but on things that are above. And then Psalm chapter one. I love the first chapter of, of Psalms. Psalms chapter one says, well, if I can, if I can get over there. Um, Psalm one says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. We have to delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it, think about it, ponder it night and day. So I read a story, and this is how I'm going to end, end this, this lesson today. I read a story that, um, that talks about floating. And I'm, I'm going to tell you this story, but I'm going to read it so that I don't miss anything in my retelling. This comes from a book called Don't, F no, it's called Glinda's Long Swim. Sorry, Glinda's Long Swim. And it was from the Incredible series. This is from a series of book from many, many years ago. And um, Glinda's Long Swim told the story of Glinda and Robert Lennon, a couple who were 
four miles off the coast of Florida fishing alone on their yacht. Glinda decided to take a swim and soon found the current had carried her too far from the boat. Her husband, hearing her cries, without thinking, dove in and swam to her. But then he realized that they were both being carried out by the tide. He was a champion swimmer, but Glinda was not. So they, made, they came up with a plan. He would swim against the tide in order to keep the boat in view until the tide ceased and he could, not, and he could reach the boat. She was going to save her strength and just float with the tide, and then he would come and get her. He fought the tide for six hours, and just as the boat was about to disappear on the horizon, the tide turned and his swimming strokes carried him to the boat, exhausted. The sun, let's see, oh, I'm so sorry, I just lost my place. The sun had set, he searched for his wife, but he could not find her. The search was futile. The next day, on one last effort of search, the search party found his wife, 20 miles out, but still alive. What an incredible story. Here's the lesson that we learn from that story. When you float, you don't stay in the same place. Now that seems really obvious, but I want you to think about that. As a Christian, if you float, if you don't do anything, if you just sit, you are going to be taken out by the tide. When you float, you are, you're going to be moved away from where you want to be. You're going to be taken out with the tide. People who float are in the danger of not going where they want to go. They're not going to get where they want to get. People who float don't go anywhere. They're at risk of being taken away farther from, from where they currently are. And we don't want to be Christians who just float. We want to be Christians who are swimming, who are swimming upstream, who are swimming maybe against the tide, and who are trying and striving to get where we need to go. If you get content to just float, number one, you're not going to go anywhere. And number two, you may even be taken out with the tide. And those are things we don't want to happen. And so this is the idea in this growing of Christian character, that it's effort. It's something, it's work. We have to work at it. But in the end, the final result is all worth it. A beautiful, beautiful Christian character who is partaking as well in the divine nature of God. And what a wonderful thing that is. So that's all I've got for you today. I hope um, that you will join me tomorrow as we look at the next attribute in this growing Christian character. Thanks for being with me today. I will talk to you later. Peace and love to you. Bye.